O Yahweh, how long shall I cry for help and you not listen? How long will I cry out to you violence and you will not save? Why do you cause me to see evil while you look at trouble? Destruction and violence happen before me. Contention and strife arise. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice does not go forth continually. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice goes forth perverted. I believe this cry from the prophet Habakkuk carries the anxieties of many today. That for many of us, the violence, the violence of this past week and the atrocities of the past few weeks have caused us to wonder, just, just where is hope when all seems hopeless? Where can we turn for hope? In, in the ancient Roman world, uh, the change from one emperor to another could evoke a sense of hope. For the people, especially if that emperor was was particularly cruel. And and this particularity of cruelness was the case for emperor after emperor in the Roman world. But but their thought is just the next one will set it all right. And and we look to elections. We look to elections to fix the crises that have arisen during the last term or like the last, the last several terms. If, if we can just get the right person in, all of our problems will just melt away. Only none of us truly believe that. And the politicians themselves know that that is false optimism, like, like unless they are particularly pretentious. But no politician is. Just, just think, of, think of the slogans of our last few presidents, and you'll, you'll kind of see what I'm getting at. Uh, change we can believe in, followed closely by the chant, yes we can. And the ultra-popular MAGA, make America great again, and build back better. All, all of these have the inherent notion of hope which would be effectuated through them or through America if we can just get it right. And in all of our perceived grandeur here in America and technological advances which so, so pompously gasinate for a better life or, or medical advances which boast the preservation of life to which we cleave so desperately to in hope, Societies offering promises of their own brand of peace and justice. If you just follow our way of doing things. And postmodernity with its skepticism of whether we can know absolute truth. Where, where all truth claims collapse into power plays of which the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was so astute. Truth becomes weaponized against people. It's just a grasp for power and control. And much of the Christian movement in America has become quite synchronistic with zealous nationalism. That to, that to be a good Christian is to hold an exceptionally high view of America as if, as if it is God's chosen nation to bring justice and peace to the world. Only we haven't even begun to get that right on our own soil. And in all this confusion, with so many things promising hope and vying for our allegiance, we quite literally don't know who we are anymore or where our hope lies. And I've, I've spoken to many, many people this week, not just about the atrocities perpetrated against the African American and Asian American communities, but also about the wars around the world and the senseless violence which saw 21 people here in Texas killed. At least 21 lives lost. And, and many, many more changed forever. For some, hope is found in stronger gun laws. And for others, hope is found in equipping teachers or office professionals or even pastors with guns. Every, everyone's searching for hope. And I've spoken to people who, who believe that we are in the end times. And for some of you sitting here this morning, 
you might, you might think that to be the case, that it may certainly seem like that, except for nearly every follower of Jesus since his ascension has thought that they were living in the end times. And in a sense, you're all right. Just, just maybe not in the same way that we think about the eschaton. And some people who take a certain view of what will happen before uh, Christ returns set their hope in being taken away to heaven before things get really bad. I don't take that view, but that's a different preaching and teaching. Where, where is hope? Where is hope in all of this confusion with, with, with all this violence and, and with hate and evil gripping and grasping at the world, with death doing its worst and seemingly winning? Where is hope when all seems hopeless? This is, this is what Paul has set before us in Colossians and what he brings to, to the pinnacle in, in a poem. Because sometimes poetry can express truth in a way that prose just cannot, even, even if it's a little confusing, which we will see this morning. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, to which, to which I now invite you to turn. Uh, Colossians 15, 1, or 1, 15 through 20 form this, this incredible poem of, of where hope truly lies for a church that is under constant threat of persecution and, and constant threat of false teaching of hope. And this section comes within the framework of why we should be thanking God and in the larger framework of walking worthy of the Lord, completely pleasing to Him. I'll get to that momentarily. Verses uh, 21 and 23 then, uh, which I will just touch on a bit this morning, uh, bring together this grand narrative of who Jesus Christ is and how what he has done uh, plays itself out for this group of Gentile believers and and by association to the rest of us as well. But Pastor Seabach will pick up on there next week, Lord willing. Colossians 1, and I, I will read starting from verse 12 where we ended last week. Being fully pleasing to Him by giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you for a share in the inheritance which belongs to the saints in light. The Father has rescued us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into uh, into the kingdom of His much-loved Son. And in His Son we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of God, the invisible one. The firstborn of all creation, because in him was created all things in the heavens and on earth. That is the totality of things, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether rulers or powers, the totality of all things through him and for him have been created. And he is before all things, and in him everything has been held together. And he is the head of the body, the church. The Son is the source, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might become supreme. Because in him, God was pleased to have his fullness take up permanent residence. And through him to reconcile to himself the totality of things through him. Whether things on earth or things in the heavens, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you formerly, being alienated and enemies in your mind, expressed through your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through his death to present you holy, without blemish, and blameless in his presence, if indeed you remain in fidelity. Having been established and firm, not moved from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was proclaimed in all of creation under the heavens, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And I I put this great hymn up on the screen so that you can see it for what it is. Um, The text is not not typeset as poetry in many of our translations, as as I believe it rightly should be. Um, And your translation has it likely just written as straight prose, which, which indeed just obscures the, this literary masterpiece's artistry and elegance. This, this poem succinctly elucidates three truths that Paul holds unequivocally crucial to knowing and understanding God's will, which, which I spoke about at some length last week. 
three truths that, that should move us towards the truth of hope and evoke within us a response that, that Paul says is wholly pleasing to God. And the, the first truth is this, that by looking to Jesus, we discover who God really is. Jesus is the image of the true God, and by looking to him, we discover who God is. And this, this, this hymn, presented in verses 15 through 20, forms one of the most Christocentric and Christ-exalting formulations that we have in all of the New Testament. This hymn begins with the pregnant phrase, The Son is the image of God, the invisible one. In the ancient world, rulers would set up all sorts of statues and images of themselves throughout their territory as signposts like pointing to their sovereignty. And, and without like, the mode or means of social media, uh, one of the ways a ruler, not- notably the Caesars, would demonstrate the reach of their might would be to have coins pressed with, with his image and small bits of inscriptions such as Divi Phileas, Son of God. Sound familiar? And these would be circulated throughout the kingdom. His, his image in his character. Yeah, of course, we wouldn't do such a thing with our money. Novus Ordo Seclorum. And no, that's not an incantation from Harry Potter. Novus Ordo Seclorum. New Order of the Ages. Printed on the back side of, of our dollar bill which bears the image of our country's first president just under the motto, Anuit Coeptus. He favors our undertakings. <laughs> From its inception, America has viewed itself as divinely accommodated and commissioned, in a sense, in a sense as revealing of God. And, and, and when, when Paul states that Jesus is the image, the icon of God, the invisible one, he is saying that in the man Jesus, God's sovereign rule has come at last. And of course, this, this language is, is marked heavily in the creation account of the Genesis. In, in a sense, what the Adams were supposed to be as the icons of God, his vice regents, his, his co-rulers, which like, went horribly wrong, In the the man Jesus, he embodies that perfectly. Humanity created as the climax of the first creation, then then the true humanity epitomized and subsumed in Jesus as the climax of the history of creation. John writes so eloquently in his gospel that no one has seen God at any time. The one and only God who is in the bosom of the Father, that one has made Him known. From from all eternity, the the Son had in His very nature been the image of God, perfectly reflecting the character of God. And as, as man, He revealed the Father in His flesh. In Jesus, this this marvelous mystery of divinity and humanity come rushing together, fulfilling the purpose that God marked out for himself and for humanity. If we want to know what God is like, if we want to know what God is like, who God is and his will, we, we must look to the revelation of his Son. He is God's image, and His words, beyond the words of of inscription on mere coins or paper, uh, the words that profoundly reveal the character and nature of God and what it means to be truly human. And this revelation of the Father through Jesus is exemplified when we we talk about what the will of God is, which which again, I, I, I spent some time on last week. In essence, Paul advances that to know the will of God and and thereby like know God, we must look to His Son, who has revealed Him. So, so like when we when we study the Scripture and we look out into our world and, and we run into the bits that like give us great pause, whether whether that's concerning violence or slavery or or patriarchal or abusive narratives, we must continually come back to Jesus. 
who, who has Jesus revealed the Father to be? Every, everything that we know about God, His will, His character, all that's revealed in Scripture must be seen through the lens of Jesus. He is, he is God's image, the perfect representation of God. Paul goes on in verse 15 to write that Jesus is the firstborn of creation. And this title, firstborn, in the Old Testament is attributed most often to Israel itself and, and, and once to the Davidic Messiah. It, it conveys the notion of priority both in time and rank. Preeminence in time and rank. C- concerning time, it says nothing about the pre-existing son being the first created being as some ancient heretics and like some modern ones propose. God the Son was never not. I'll say that positively. God the Son always was. He always has subsisted with the Father. So what, what, the, hymn in, what the hymn has in mind regarding Him being the firstborn and, and instead is, is what John actually states at the beginning of his Gospel, which the New English Bible translates, I think, most appropriately. When all things began... The Word already was. When all things began, the Word already was. He he is of one essence, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit. He is is preeminent in time. And concerning rank, the, the firstborn is a poetic way of saying that Jesus is supreme over all creation. And as we will see in just a bit, over new creation as well. We we may be culturally removed from understanding the implications of the firstborn. Uh, But but the firstborn in in a Greco and Roman household was the heir of the estate. Everything went to the firstborn. Not like like our wills today where we start spreading things out evenly. (laughs) It's not the way it worked then. And in the Old Testament, the firstborn had special privileges of inheritance. And the firstborn was also to be dedicated and consecrated to Yahweh. Belonged to Yahweh in a special way. Jesus, Jesus then, is the inheritor of all that is. And the central notion conveyed through through all of this is Jesus' function in bringing creation into being and his sovereignty over the entire created order. The, The point of the firstborn metaphor is to distinguish Jesus from the creation rather than subsuming him under it as a created being. And, and this brings St. Paul to, to the rationale behind this initial proclamation that Jesus is the image of God, the invisible one, the firstborn of all creation. Because the second truth that the hymn so vividly declares is that in Jesus, the totality of creation has been held together. In, in Jesus, the totality of creation has been held together. And, and the three little phrases, three, three little prepositions uh, here are so crucial to understanding the role of the Son in creation and, and thereby also new creation, which Paul is starting to press towards. Paul writes in in verse 16, because in him were created all things in the heavens and on earth, that is the totality of things, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions, whether rulers or powers, the totality of things through him and for him have been created. And he is before all things and in him Everything has been held together. In Him, through Him, and for Him. There's there's so much packed into this tight, concise declaration. But whatever exists, whether whether the unseen world of the heavens, uh, or heaven's space, or the seen world and the perceived world of earth, any power structure or authority, whatever realities you think of in these terms, they are all entities that even if they don't acknowledge Him and they push against Him and fight and struggle against His reign, they owe their existence to Him. And 
and, and God, God has never ceased being the rightful king of his creation, even though his icon from the beginning has given their allegiance to another. And, and the psalmist knew this fact intimately, and he expressed it idyllically when he praises Yahweh for his wonderful deeds. He declares, Yahweh sits enthroned forever. And he has established his throne for judgment. And the New Testament authors pick up this language and they apply it to God's chosen one, the Messiah, His Son, God in flesh. The, the ascension of the Messiah, which, which, uh, which has been excluded from many of our celebrations of God's work in the Messiah, we're, we're big on Christmas and Easter, we leave some of the leftovers for, but the ascension, we just bypass. The ascension has tremendous implications concerning the faithfulness of of the Messiah Jesus in bringing about the plan and purpose of God. It's very much the crux of the right and rule of God in the present age and the age to come, which which is pressing presently into the world. He is reigning right now from heaven, and we await His reign on earth. You, you cannot have the fullness of the glory of the resurrection without the ascension. Jesus, Jesus Paul says, is, is the hope that is reserved for us in the heavens by nature of his ascension. The ascension is a central, is a central and vital theme to Christian belief. Without it, all sorts of things start to go awry. And for St. Paul, the ascension is held in in tight parallel with the resurrection. Because the new world has has erupted uh, in the resurrection, and the king of of the new creation has taken his seat upon his throne. And this reality will one day be realized on earth as it is in heaven. It's true now, but waiting its fullness, and it embodies hope. It may be hard for us to grasp the reign of perfect goodness and justice and mercy and grace as we are faced with such violence and hatred as we have witnessed over the last few months and weeks around the world and even in our own communities. But our hope lies not in politics or guns or nationalism or who's in office or anything else brought forth uh, which, which we so desperately grasp for because hope is promised. Our, our hope is a person. Our hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Israel's promised anointed king has become king of the whole creation. And this reality, though hard to grasp, is the essence of hope. Because, because Jesus reigns over, over the whole creation as its rightful king, the powers of this present world, whether seen or unseen, are subject to him. He is the image of Yahweh's reign for all time, in all time, and everything is subject to him. The totality of creation that came into being through him, but by the word of God, it came through him and it is for him. All that was created is to display his glory, the glory of God himself, and ultimately he will be glorified in the new creation. And this, this uh, exaltation of the Christ after his work on the cross gives him publicly the status that he has always in fact enjoyed as a right And and since, as Paul states in the Christ poem here, that everything in the heavens and earth was created in Him, through Him, and for Him. So when we we witness people and we witness rulers and authorities uh, abusing their power against people, against (laughs) against others, as we have seen... as we have seen throughout history and as, as still so prevalent in our world today, they will be held to account. And if we are perpetrators abusing our power, we will be held to account as well. Because Jesus is King. So the natural question I think that flows from saying that everything is subject to the Messiah is then just why is there so much evil that seemingly goes unchecked? Why is there so much evil that that just seemingly goes unchecked? 
And Paul, Paul may not give us the answer that we want. But he will go on to say in chapter 3, verse 15, that Christ has disarmed the rulers and authorities on the cross and he made a, a public display of them, triumphing over them by means of the cross. In other words, what, what, what Christ has done through the cross resurrection and his ascension has broken the oppressive grip of evil and though those powers are still gripping and grasping at the world in rebellion he remains their true lord they don't have ultimate authority and jesus is not just another lord among lords uh, merely another ruler but he is another kind of ruler different kind of ruler he is the one in whom God's righteous and loving reign comes to the earth he's not just another cult figure for the Colossians or for us to pledge our allegiance to he is the divine Lord through whom everything comes into existence this is this is what this hymn is getting at by proclaiming that in Jesus the totality of creation has been held together there's there's nothing outside of his sovereign rule and authority because he is preeminent He's, he's supreme. All the kingship language of the Old Testament attributed to Yahweh is now cast upon Jesus. He is supreme, and in His supremacy, He alone is sufficient to bring about God's will for His creation. To, to, to renew that which is bent and broken and to bring about new creation. Which, which brings us to the third truth that this incredible hymn sets forth. In Jesus, the totality of creation is held together, and in Jesus, new creation bursts forth in the world. In verse 17, Paul writes that he is before, that that is, he is superior over the totality, and in him, the totality of creation has been held together. And in verse 18, he says, he is the head of the body, the church. The Son is the source, the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything He might become supreme. So so just as as through the Son, creation comes into being, through the Son, new creation bursts forth in a remarkable display. Uh, Again, as, as life has come in Jesus, as life begins in Jesus, the firstborn, the resurrection life begins in Him as well. Both in time and rank. T. Wright has has rightfully said that Jesus' resurrection was thus accomplished so that in everything he might have supremacy. That which was his by right, he became in fact. That God's plan is not merely to sum up the old creation, but to inaugurate the new creation in and through him. And this resurrection life, this new life in Christ is nothing less than new creation. A new humanity. uh, uh, The true humanity governed by God's will for His creation. I've I've said before, this this new life um, that the biblical authors call freedom, though, though set in the confines of God's way of life, is true freedom. It is what to be true human. To be truly human, not not for us to to color outside the lines and push those boundaries away. And and as as He is the firstborn, preeminent over all the creation, because all the creation and life has come about through Him, He is also the firstborn and preeminent from the dead. He is the firstborn of new creation, of new life. And Paul calls the people of this new life in Christ the church. The church is is the evidence or the beginning of resurrected life. The body of of the head who is Christ of which we are a part. We are are people of resurrected life. And and, and this life, as Paul will go on to elucidate later in the letter, as, as, as he has briefly said before, this life will bear the fruit of the gospel. how we live matters we are to live in accordance with the knowledge of God's will 
which is revealed in the gospel and in Jesus himself. Humanity was created to be the perfect representation of God's self-expression within his world so, so that he could live among his people. But in rebellion, that relationship gets all twisted and bent and we begin to look at a myriad of other things for hope, whether it is in America or technology or medicine or laws or guns or whatever else. And then coming back to the imagery which began the hymn, Paul states in verse 19 that the fullness of God himself was pleased to take up permanent, permanent residence in him. That in Jesus, divinity and humanity come together, both natures being fully his and inseparable. The great creed of Chalcedon states it like this. Jesus is one and the same Christ Son, Lord, only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the, distinct, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person, one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a really complex way of saying He is fully God and fully man. He is not sometimes God and sometimes man. He is not sometimes acting in accordance to divinity and sometimes acting as a human. Both natures are fully His. He is the revealer not only of the Father, but also of true humanity. Jesus is the very image of God the Invisible One, His perfect representation, recapitulating all that humanity and Israel was supposed to be. And in Him, the fullness of God has taken up permanent residence. Never ceasing to be God, He becomes man. And Paul writes in verse 20 that through this God-man, through the God-man, the Father purposed to reconcile the totality of creation to Himself. Through Jesus. Now, uh, to, to reconcile something means, means to bring it back into proper relationship. The, the, the picture here, in a sense, uh, and, and what the, the hymn is pressing towards and what Paul does in, in other places is that in Jesus, this relationship for which God created things, everything, the relationship uh, which, is, which is twisted and bent in rebellion has been reconciled. It has been brought back to its proper standing. I don't, I don't think many of us still reconcile checkbooks. Is that, is that still a thing for anyone? You still reconcile your checkbook? Uh, uh, Businesses reconcile their ledgers like all the time, right? Uh, uh, do, do they still teach how to like reconcile ledgers and checkbooks in school? No. Thank you for that honesty. <laughs> uh, it, but but the, the imagery though is, is in reconciling their books, they, they are bringing the records back into proper standing. So that whatever might have been messed up, through, through whatever means, is, is getting set, set back to right. And the setting of that relationship between financial records and banks is the setting back of things the way they should be. And, and this setting of things to rights is, is not just accomplished by, by his, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, as crucial as those are to the faith. But it is in his very person that God and humanity in perfect unity come in Jesus. A relationship that was always supposed to be. God and humanity uh, together in Him as He is reconciling the totality of creation to Himself. In Jesus, God is setting all things to rights. And in that setting of all things to rights, God is glorified as God and we along with creation are the glorifiers of God. This notion is at the very heart of what happened at the first rebellion, that, that humanity in the, in the atoms elevated itself to the place of God, desiring to be their own gods and goddesses. And that relationship between God and humankind becomes twisted. It no longer reflects uh, God in the world as his icon, but humanity desires to reflect itself as, its, as God. We desire to create truth for ourselves, 
to please ourselves, to gratify ourselves, to glorify ourselves. We are inwardly self-focused. But in Christ, this is brought back to rights. God glorified as God and humanity along with the totality of creation, His glorifiers. All things are brought back into proper relationship since the totality was created in Him, through Him, and for Him, for His glory. And as the body of Christ, we now participate in this ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors of the risen and ascended and supreme King. We are signposts pointing others to the Messiah who is hope itself. We are, we are living images of God in Christ, revealing Him and His glory in the world. How do you think we should live? If we are searching for hope in all other things, what will our ministry be to those who do not know God? Our response to this glorious truth should be thanksgiving to the Father. Our response to the glorious truth of who Christ is and what He has done should be thanksgiving to the Father. I said last week that there were two distinct responses to the knowledge of God and what He has done through the Gospel. And we only got to one of them last week. But Paul writes in verse 12 that a walk that is worthy of God, completely pleasing to Him, is a walk that is marked by thanksgiving. So how do we please God? We ascribe to Him the thanks holy do Him. Every, everything that we have witnessed this morning is a commentary of why the Father is due praise. And when we think about all that God has done through the Son in reconciling us to Himself, how can we not but respond in thankfulness? Thanksgiving reveals an understanding of what God has done. It reveals a deep humility and posture of worship rightly due to the Father. And, and, and gratitude is, is a theme that is so prevalent in all of Paul's writings. Because he has, been, he has been brought to and through God calling him from darkness unto light. Like, like literally blinding light on the road to Damascus. And he in turn encourages the Colossians who have now have a share in the inheritance of God which belongs to His holy ones in light, to live lives marked by joyful thanksgiving which is wholly pleasing to God. The more intimately we are acquainted with our hope, who is Jesus, the more thankfulness will mark our lives. See, if, if you show me a person who abounds in thanksgiving, I will show you a person who is intimately acquainted with the gospel. The converse is true as well. I'm out of time, so I'll conclude with this. In verses 12 through 14, uh, which, which really set up this great hymn, the notion of the Father rescuing His people from, from this domain of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of His love is, is deeply steeped in the Exodus from Egypt narrative. That, that through God's servant Moses, the Israelites learned more fully who their God was when he was redeeming them from their slave master in Egypt. And through Jesus, the world may now know, the world may now learn through the gospel, the full truth of God. In, in Jesus, God is at last reconciling the creation unto himself. The creation that came about in the Son, through the Son, and for the Son is also recon, uh, reconciled by God in the Son, through the Son, and for the Son. Through the resurrection from the dead, new creation has come. As He is the divine agency of the first creation, He is also the agency of new creation. He Himself is the hope of resurrection reserved for His people in the heavens, awaiting the consummation of that new creation. When heaven and earth will come together and God will dwell with His people 
There are, there are so many things in our world which promise hope, which promise peace, and it is easy to look at them as our salvation from oppression or sickness or violence, but there is only one person in whom hope is found. As believers, we have been given the truth of the gospel, and we must live in this truth. And our hope is in the one who is reserved for us in the heavens. And no matter, no matter what comes in this life, our life is hidden in him. And as the reality of our redemption and reconciliation through the blood of his cross is sure because of his continuing faithfulness, that though it awaits fully to be realized, what is our hope is seen with our eyes when what comes from heaven comes to earth once again? when our hope is seen with our very eyes. Like, what more then can be the means for deep-rooted, habitual thanksgiving to God? Let us, let us be a church family that is firmly rooted in the knowledge of God's will in redeeming and reconciling his world through the Messiah Jesus, and because of that knowledge, bear fruit of the gospel in his world and return all praise and thanksgiving to him. Let us be a church that is marked in thanksgiving to the incredible work that God has done. Let me pray for us. God, indeed, we stand in awe of your magnificence, in Christ Jesus, through whom the world was created, the world is being and will be recreated. As we say, as we say and think of those words, God, that it seems it seems too little to merely give you thanks. But this is what pleases you that that our thanks and our praise would would constantly be on you and lifted up to you. So God, we pray that in your Spirit. And by the moving and growing of your spirit through the church, that, that you will be glorified and that we will live lives marked by thanksgiving, focused and holding fast to our hope, Jesus. It is in his name that we pray these things through his spirit. Amen.